Hey folks, before the video starts, please leave a like and subscribe to cheer me up. Make sure you are relaxed and enjoy today's stories. I found an online game that shouldn't exist. Now I can't stop playing. I'm not the type of person who gets easily freaked out. I've seen all the horror movies played the scariest video games, and even dipped my toes into the weird corners of the internet. So when a friend of mine, who we'll call Dan, sent me a link to a deep web game, I wasn't really scared, just curious. Dan and I have always been into tech. We spent our high school years hacking together weird little projects, cracking old games, and generally messing around on the internet more than was probably healthy but we always had a good sense of where the line was and we knew better than to really dive into the deep web. You hear stories about what's lurking there and most of it is probably fake, but we weren't stupid enough to test it. That's why when Dan sent me the link, my first reaction was to brush it off. I mean, it's 2024. Who's still going on about deep web horror stories? But something about the way he texted me caught my attention. There was none of his usual sarcasm, no dumb jokes, just a simple, you have to see this, but be careful. Dan never says be careful. He's the kind of guy who thinks everything is a joke. So that got me. I clicked the link. Now, before you jump to conclusions, no, I wasn't using my main computer. I'm not that dumb. I spun up an old laptop I use for testing connected through a VPN, and dove in. The link led to a plain black page with a single line of text. Welcome to the waiting room. Below it, there was a play button. There were no credits, no title, no nothing. Just that line and a button. I hesitated for a moment, considering whether this was all some elaborate prank, but the curiosity was killing me, so I clicked play. The screen went black for a few seconds and I was about to close out when the game loaded in. It was a top-down perspective, pixel art style, kind of like an old RPG from the 90s. The graphics were basic but clean, almost too clean for something that looked so retro. My character was a little white dot sitting in what looked like a small empty room with grey walls. I moved the character around with the arrow keys. There wasn't much to do at first. The room was empty except for a door on the far side. I walked up to it and a prompt appeared. Are you ready? Without really thinking, I hit the enter key and the door opened. Behind it was a long hallway dimly lit with flickering lights that reminded me of something out of a horror game. But it wasn't scary, not really, just unsettling. I walked down the hallway and the screen started to glitch. It wasn't like a normal game glitch where the graphics get all messed up. It was more like the game itself was distorting, as if something was trying to mess with it in real time. The wall stretched and contracted, the lights flickered more rapidly, and the audio what had been a low, humming noise, started to warble and hiss. Still, I kept going. At the end of the hallway, there was another door. This one was different though. It was red, bright red, almost like it was glowing. Another prompt appeared. Do you want to know the truth? I don't know why, but this made me hesitate. It felt like the game was asking something more than just whether I wanted to continue. But again, curiosity got the best of me. I pressed enter. The screen went black again, and this time it stayed black. I thought maybe the game had crashed, but then I heard it. A voice, low and crackling, like someone whispering through a radio with bad reception. I couldn't make out the words but it sent a shiver down my spine. The screen flickered back on, and my little white dot 
of a character was standing in what looked like a living room. But it wasn't just any living room. It was my living room. The pixel art was unmistakable. The same old brown couch. The same cheap coffee table I bought from Ikea last year. The same layout. It was my exact living room. Down to the scuff marks on the floor. From where I dropped a dumbbell a few months back. I sat back in my chair. Trying to process what I was seeing. How the hell did this game know what my living room looked like? I hadn't given it any permissions, hadn't done anything that would let it access my webcam or files. But there it was, on the screen. And then, as I watched, the white dot moved on its own. It walked across the living room, stopped at the front door, and another prompt appeared. Are you ready to let me in? I slammed the laptop shut, heart pounding. I don't know why, but something about that message filled me with a kind of dread I hadn't felt in a long time. Like something was wrong, really wrong. I told myself it was just a game, just a weird deep web prank, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I had done something I shouldn't have. I pushed the laptop away, deciding that was enough internet for one night. But when I got up to turn off the lights, I glanced at my front door, and that's when I noticed something that hadn't been there before. There was a single, small red mark on the door handle. It looked like a fingerprint. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that red fingerprint on the door handle, as if it was burned into my memory. I kept telling myself, it was just a coincidence. Maybe I'd gotten some paint on my hand earlier, or it was a trick of the light. But no matter how many times I tried to convince myself, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very, very wrong. By the time morning rolled around, I was a mess. I hadn't touched the laptop since shutting it the night before, and it sat on my desk like a ticking time bomb. I kept thinking about Dan, wondering if he'd had the same experience, but something told me not to reach out. I didn't want to drag him further into whatever this was, and honestly, I didn't want to hear him laugh it off. This didn't feel like something to joke about. I went about my day, trying to ignore the creeping sense of dread that hung over me. Work was a blur. I couldn't focus on anything. Every time my phone buzzed with a notification, my heart jumped, half expecting it to be something sinister. But it was always just spam emails or random group chats. It wasn't until later that evening that I finally mustered the courage to open the laptop again. I told myself it was just to delete the game, to wipe the laptop clean and move on. But deep down, I knew that wasn't the only reason. There was a part of me that needed to know more, that needed to understand what had happened. When I opened the laptop, the screen was black. For a second, I thought maybe the battery had died, but then I saw it, a single line of text in white, right in the middle of the screen. Welcome back. I froze, fingers hovering over the keyboard. I hadn't reopened the game. Hell, I hadn't even connected the laptop to the internet since last night, but somehow the game was still running. There was no option to exit, no X to click, no task manager that could force it closed. The only thing on the screen was that phrase, welcome back, and below it, a blinking cursor as if waiting for me to respond. My hands were shaking as I typed, who are you? For a moment, nothing happened. Then, the screen flickered, and more text appeared, slow and deliberate. I am the truth. I felt a chill run down my spine. This was no ordinary game, no prank, no hack. There was something behind this, something that knew more than it should. I didn't know what to type next. What do you say to something like that? But before I could figure it out, 
The screen changed again. My living room appeared. The same pixel art version as before. Only now, there was something different. The front door was open, and outside, in the pixelated darkness, something was moving. I leaned in closer, trying to make out what it was. At first, it was just a shadow, a dark shape slowly shifting in the doorway. But then it stepped forward, and I could see it was a figure, a person, or at least something that looked like one. It was featureless, a silhouette, but there was something wrong about the way it moved. It was too smooth, too deliberate, like it wasn't walking so much as gliding. The figure stopped in the middle of the living room, facing my character, and another prompt appeared. Do you see now? I didn't know what to do. My heart was pounding so hard I could barely think. All I wanted was to shut the laptop, throw it out the window, and pretend this had never happened. But I couldn't move. It was like I was glued to the chair, staring at that screen, waiting for whatever was going to happen next. And then, the figure started to move again. Slowly, it turned toward the screen, toward me, as if it could see me sitting there. The perspective shifted, and suddenly, I was looking through its eyes. The living room stretched out in front of me, distorted and warped, like a funhouse mirror version of my own space. I watched, helpless, as the figure moved toward the front door. My heart sank as I realized what was happening. It wasn't just inside the game anymore. It was in my house. The screen flickered and the view changed again. Now, I was looking down the hallway that led from the living room to my bedroom. The figure was moving closer, step by step, and with each step, the screen distorted more, the walls bending and twisting like they were made of rubber. I slammed the laptop shut, breathing hard. I couldn't do this. Whatever this was, it was too much. I grabbed the laptop and shoved it in a drawer, determined not to touch it again. But as I stood there, trying to calm down, I heard something. A faint creak, like the sound of a door opening. I froze, ears straining to catch the noise. It was coming from the hallway, the hallway right outside my bedroom. My blood ran cold as I realized the sound wasn't coming from the laptop. It was coming from inside my house. Slowly, I turned toward the door. It was half open, just as I'd left it. But now, there was a shadow in the doorway. A long, dark shadow that stretched across the floor, growing larger by the second. My heart was in my throat as I backed away, inching toward the window. But the shadow didn't move. It just stood there, silent and still as if waiting. I didn't wait to see what would happen next. I bolted for the window, threw it open, and climbed out onto the fire escape. I didn't stop running until I was halfway down the block, panting and sweating in the cool night air. I spent the night at a friend's place, not telling them what had happened, just saying I needed a place to crash. I couldn't bring myself to go back home. Not after what I'd seen, but I knew I couldn't avoid it forever. When I finally did go back the next day, I found the door to my bedroom wide open, but nothing was out of place. No sign of an intruder, no evidence of anything strange, except for one thing. There was a new red fingerprint on the wall next to the door. This one was larger, more defined almost like someone had pressed their entire hand against the wall. I don't know what's happening or what that game is, but I'm starting to realize it's not something I can just walk away from, and I have a feeling it's not done with me yet. I couldn't stay at home after that. Every time I looked at that red handprint on the wall, I felt like I was being watched, like whatever was behind the game was waiting for me to slip up, to let my guard down. 
So I packed a bag and went to stay at a motel on the other side of town, somewhere I knew I wouldn't be alone. The place was a little run down, the kind of spot where the rooms always smell faintly of old cigarette smoke, no matter how much they clean. But it was safe. Or at least, it felt safe enough. I told myself I was just being paranoid, that I'd go back home in a few days after I'd gotten some distance from all this. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. This thing, whatever it was, wasn't going to just go away. I needed answers. On the third night at the motel, I finally gave in. I took the laptop out of the bag where I'd stashed it and opened it up. The screen flickered to life and my heart sank when I saw that the game was still running. The last thing I'd seen was that hallway, the figure moving toward my bedroom door, and that's exactly where the game picked up. The figure was still there, standing in the hallway, just a few steps away from the door. But something was different now. The screen was darker, the colors more muted, like the life had been drained out of the image. The figure wasn't moving anymore. It just stood there, frozen, as if waiting for me to do something. I hesitated, my fingers hovering over the keyboard. Part of me wanted to shut the laptop again, to forget all about this, but I knew that wasn't an option anymore. If I didn't figure out what was happening, I'd never be free of it. So I typed, what do you want? For a long moment, nothing happened. Then, slowly, the screen started to shift. The figure dissolved into pixels, breaking apart and reforming into something else. The screen went black, and then words appeared, one line at a time. You opened the door. My breath caught in my throat. I didn't know what that meant, but it didn't sound good. I typed back, what door? The response came almost instantly. The door to the truth. The screen flickered and suddenly I was back in the game. But this time, the setting was different. I wasn't in my apartment anymore. The pixelated character was standing in a dark, empty space with walls that seemed to pulse and breathe like a living thing. The atmosphere was suffocating like the game itself was alive and watching me. There was no clear path to follow, just endless darkness in every direction. I moved the character forward and the screen began to glitch again, the pixels warping and distorting. The walls started closing in, narrowing the space until it felt like I was being squeezed, suffocated. And then, in the distance, I saw something. A flickering light, faint but unmistakable. It was a tiny red dot, glowing like an ember in the darkness. I guided the character toward it, the glitches growing worse with every step. The walls were almost touching now, pressing in from all sides, but I kept moving forward, drawn to that light. When I finally reached it, the screen flashed and the light expanded, filling the screen with a blinding red glow. I had to look away, the intensity of it burning into my eyes even through the screen. And then, just as suddenly, it was gone. The screen went black, and for a moment, I thought maybe the game had finally crashed. But then, words appeared, slowly fading into view. You can't stop now. The screen flickered, and I was back in the game. This time, the character was in a room that looked eerily familiar. It took me a moment to place it, but then I realized it was the motel room I was staying in, recreated in pixel art with unsettling accuracy. The same faded wallpaper, the same cheap bedspread, even the same flickering light above the door. The character was standing in the middle of the room, facing the door. And as I watched, the door slowly began to open. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at the screen, not daring to move. The door swung open all the way, revealing the dark hallway outside. 
For a long moment, nothing happened. The scream was still, the only movement coming from the flickering light overhead. And then, something stepped into the room. It was the figure, the same shadowy, featureless silhouette from before. But this time, it was different. It was larger, more defined, almost like it had grown stronger, more real. It moved with purpose, gliding across the room toward the character. And I knew, I knew it was coming for me. I slammed the laptop shut, my heart racing. The room was dead silent. The only sound, the pounding of my own heartbeat in my ears. I looked around, half expecting to see the figure standing in the corner, but the room was empty. Just the same dingy motel room, as lifeless and drab as ever. But the sense of dread was overwhelming. I could feel it, like a weight pressing down on my chest, like the air had turned thick and suffocating. I knew that shutting the laptop wasn't enough. This thing, whatever it was, had found me. I jumped up from the bed, pacing the room, trying to figure out what to do. I couldn't stay here. I couldn't stay anywhere. Not if it could find me, no matter where I went, but running didn't seem like an option either. It felt like this thing was connected to me now like it was inside my head, inside my life. And that's when I heard it, a faint whispering sound, just barely audible over the pounding of my heart. It was coming from the laptop, still sitting on the bed where I'd left it. The screen was closed, but the whispering was getting louder, more insistent. I didn't want to open it again. I didn't want to see what was on that screen but I couldn't ignore it, not when it was calling to me like that. With trembling hands, I opened the laptop. The screen was black, but the whispering continued, growing louder and louder until it was deafening, like a hundred voices all speaking at once, all saying the same thing. Let me in. The words appeared on the screen, written in red as the whispering reached a fever pitch. My hands were shaking so hard, I could barely keep hold of the laptop. The screen started to glitch again, the words distorting and twisting, but they were still legible, still clear. Let me in. I couldn't take it anymore. I slammed the laptop shut, threw it back in the bag, and bolted out of the room. I didn't stop running until I was outside gasping for air in the cool night breeze. I don't know where I'm going to go now or what I'm going to do, but I know one thing for sure. This isn't just a game. It's something much worse. Something that doesn't just want to be played. It wants to be let in. And I'm terrified that I've already let it too close. I spent the next few hours driving aimlessly just trying to put distance between me and that motel. Every time I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the rearview mirror, I half expected to see that shadowy figure sitting in the back seat, silently watching me. The thought made my skin crawl. So I focused on the road, the dark, empty streets stretching out before me. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I couldn't go home. Home wasn't safe anymore, not with whatever was happening, but driving around aimlessly wasn't going to solve anything either. I needed a plan. I needed help. I pulled over into an empty parking lot, my hands trembling as I fumbled for my phone. I didn't know who to call. The police wouldn't believe me, and I wasn't even sure what I'd tell them if they did that I was being haunted by a game, that something was following me, something that shouldn't exist. But there was one person I could think of, someone who might understand, someone who had seen the dark side of the internet before. I dialed Dan's number, my heart pounding, as I listened to the phone ring. For a moment, I thought he wasn't going to pick up, but then there was a click. 
and his voice came through the line, groggy and annoyed. What the hell, man? It's like three in the morning. I didn't even know where to start. Dan, something's wrong. That game you sent me. It's not just a game. There was a pause, and I could hear him shifting in bed, the sound of sheets rustling. What are you talking about? It's just some dumb deep web thing. Did you really call me at 3 a.m. to talk about that? No, I said my voice shaking. Dan, listen to me. It's doing something. It knows things about me, about where I am. It's like it's alive or something. And now I think it's following me. He was silent for a long moment. And when he finally spoke, his tone was different, quieter, more serious. What exactly happened? I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. It started with these weird glitches, but then it got worse. The game. It showed me things. My apartment. The motel I was staying at. And there was this figure. This shadow. It was in the game at first, but now I think it's real. I can't explain it, but I know it's coming for me. Dan didn't say anything for a while, and I started to think maybe he didn't believe me. But then he sighed, and I heard him get out of bed. Okay, look, I don't know what's going on, but we need to figure this out. You can't be dealing with this alone. Where are you right now? I glanced around, trying to make sense of my surroundings. Some parking lot. I don't even know. I've just been driving. Okay, he said, his voice calm but firm. Find a place with people around, a diner, a gas station, something like that. Stay in public, where it's safe. I'm going to dig into this, see if I can find out what the hell that game is and where it came from. Whatever you do, don't go back to your apartment and don't be alone. Got it? I nodded, even though he couldn't see me. Got it. Thanks, Dan. Don't thank me yet he said. Just stay safe. I'll call you as soon as I find something. I hung up, feeling a little more grounded now that Dan was involved. If anyone could figure out what was going on, it was him. But I knew I couldn't just sit around and wait. I needed to keep moving. I found an all-night diner a few miles down the road. A dingy little place with neon lights buzzing faintly in the windows. It was the kind of place that never really closed, where truckers and night owls came for cheap coffee and greasy food. I parked the car and went inside, hoping the constant flow of people would make me feel less alone, less vulnerable. The waitress, a tired-looking woman in her fifties, barely glanced at me as she handed me a menu. I ordered a coffee and settled into a booth near the back where I could keep an eye on the door. The place was quiet, the hum of conversation low and distant, like white noise in the background. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that at any moment, the figure from the game might walk through the door and find me. I took out my phone, scrolling aimlessly through social media, trying to distract myself. But every notification Every buzz made my heart jump. I kept checking my messages, hoping for something from Dan, but there was nothing. And then, just as I was about to give up and try calling him again, my phone buzzed with an unknown number. My first instinct was to ignore it, but something told me to pick up. Hello? I answered, my voice barely above a whisper. There was silence on the other end, followed by a faint crackling, like static. I was about to hang up when I heard it, a voice, low and distorted, like it was coming from a broken speaker. Let me in. My blood ran cold. It was the same voice I had heard from the game, the same words that had been whispering from the laptop. But now, it was on my phone, invading a place it had no business being. I didn't say anything. I just sat there, clutching the phone, my heart hammering in my chest. 
the voice repeated itself, slower this time, more deliberate. Let. Me. In. I couldn't take it anymore. I ended the call, dropping the phone on the table, as if it had burned me. I glanced around the diner, but no one seemed to notice my panic. The truckers kept eating their meals, the waitress kept pouring coffee, and the world just kept turning like nothing was wrong. But something was wrong. Something was very, very wrong. I picked up the phone, my hands trembling, and dialed Dan's number again. It rang once, twice, and then went straight to voicemail. I tried again, but the same thing happened. Panic started to creep in. What if something had happened to him? What if the game had found him too? I couldn't shake the feeling that I was running out of time, that whatever was behind this was closing in, cutting off my options one by one. I sat there in the booth, staring at the phone, trying to figure out what to do next. The diner was starting to feel less safe, the walls closing in like in the game, the light too harsh, too glaring. I needed to get out of there, but I had nowhere to go. And then, as I was about to leave, my phone buzzed again. This time, it was a text, just one word from Dan's number. Run. I didn't need to be told twice. I grabbed my bag and bolted out of the diner, not stopping to see if anyone noticed or cared. The night air hit me like a slap in the face, cold and sharp, but it didn't clear my head. My thoughts were a jumbled mess of fear and confusion, and all I could do was run. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care. I just needed to get away, to put as much distance as I could between me and whatever was chasing me. But as I ran, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was already too late, that no matter how fast I ran, I couldn't escape it. I reached the car and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get the door open, but when I finally did, I froze. There on the driver's seat was a single red fingerprint, smeared across the fabric like fresh paint. It wasn't just in the game anymore, it was here, in the real world, and it had found me. I backed away, heart pounding in my chest, and that's when I heard it, a soft, almost inaudible whisper, carried on the wind. Let me in. I don't know how long I stood there, paralyzed by fear, but when I finally moved, it was like my body was acting on autopilot. I turned and ran, leaving the car behind, leaving everything behind. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew one thing for sure. Whatever this was, it wasn't going to stop until it got what it wanted, and I wasn't sure I had the strength to keep it out. I ran until my legs burned and my lungs felt like they were on fire. The city around me blurred into a haze of dark streets and faintly glowing windows, the world reduced to a twisted maze that offered no escape. I had no destination, just the overwhelming need to keep moving, to stay ahead of whatever was chasing me. Eventually, I found myself in an industrial area on the outskirts of the town. The buildings here were old and abandoned, the kind of places where you'd expect to find graffiti-covered walls and broken windows. The streets were deserted, not a soul in sight, just the occasional flicker of a distant streetlight. I could feel the weight of the silence pressing down on me, and for a moment I wondered if I had finally outrun it, but deep down I knew better. I stumbled into one of the abandoned buildings, a crumbling warehouse with rusted metal doors and cracked concrete floors. The place smelled of decay and neglect, but it was shelter, somewhere I could catch my breath, at least for a little while. I found a spot in the corner, huddled against the wall, trying to calm my racing heart. My phone was still in my hand but I was too afraid to look at it, too afraid that I'd see another message or hear that voice again. But I knew I couldn't avoid it forever. 
Whatever this thing was, it wasn't going to just disappear. After what felt like hours, I finally forced myself to look at the phone. There were no new messages, no missed calls, just the empty waiting screen. A small part of me hoped that maybe, just maybe, it was over, that I'd somehow escaped. But then the phone buzzed in my hand, and I almost dropped it in fear. The screen lit up with a single notification, a voicemail left just a few minutes ago. The number was blocked, untraceable. I hesitated, my thumb hovering over the play button. I knew I shouldn't listen to it, knew that nothing good would come of it, but the need to know was overwhelming, a compulsion I couldn't ignore. I hit play. At first, there was nothing but static. That same crackling noise I'd heard before, like a broken radio signal. But then, the voice came through, low and distorted, almost drowned out by the static. Let me in. It repeated over and over, the words echoing in my ears, growing louder, more insistent. The voice wasn't just coming from the phone anymore. It was all around me, filling the room, seeping into my mind. I dropped the phone, clutching my head, trying to block out the sound, but it was useless. The voice was inside me now, a part of me, and I could feel it worming its way deeper, trying to break through. And then, just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. The silence that followed was deafening, more terrifying than the voice itself. I picked up the phone with trembling hands, staring at the screen. The voicemail was gone, deleted without a trace. But there was something else, an app, one I hadn't downloaded, sitting on my home screen. It was a simple icon, just a red door on a black background. My breath caught in my throat. I didn't want to open it. I knew that whatever was on the other side of that door was something I couldn't face but I also knew I didn't have a choice. This was the end game, the final step in whatever twisted path I'd been led down. With a deep breath, I tapped the icon. The screen went black, and for a moment, I thought the phone had died. But then the image flickered to life, and I was staring at that same pixelated figure, the one that had haunted me from the beginning. It was standing in the same dark space, the walls pulsing around it like a living, breathing thing. But now, there was something different. The figure was holding something, a key glowing faintly in its hand, and in front of it, there was a door. Not just any door. The door from my apartment, perfectly rendered in pixel art. A prompt appeared on the screen. Are you ready to open the final door? I wanted to scream, to throw the phone away and run, but I knew it wouldn't matter. This was it. The only way to end this was to see it through, to face whatever was waiting behind that door. I pressed the button. The figure moved forward, inserting the key into the lock. The door creaked open, revealing nothing but darkness beyond. For a moment, nothing happened. And then, out of the darkness, something began to emerge. A shape, slowly forming, becoming clearer with every passing second. It was the figure. But this time, it wasn't just a shadow. It was real. More real than anything I'd seen before. It stepped through the door, into the game, and then, out of the screen. I stared in horror as the figure began to materialize in front of me, its form solidifying, taking on a life of its own. It was tall, featureless, its body a mass of shifting shadows that seemed to suck the light out of the room. It had no eyes, no mouth, but I could feel it watching me, feel its presence wrapping around me like a suffocating blanket. And then, without a sound, it reached out, its hands stretching toward me, impossibly long fingers curling around my throat. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The world around me started to fade, 
the darkness closing in, and all I could see was that red door hanging open in my mind. As the figure tightened its grip, I realized the truth. The door had always been there, in the back of my mind, waiting for me to open it. And now that I had, there was no going back. In the final moments before everything went black, I heard the voice again, soft and cold, whispering in my ear, You let me in. And then, there was nothing. I discovered a dark web hitman service. I think I'm their next target. You know how they say curiosity killed the cat? I used to laugh at that. It seemed like such an old-timey saying, something parents would use to scare their kids into behaving. But now, after everything that's happened, I get it. I really get it. It all started about a month ago. I've always been fascinated by the darker corners of the internet. Not for anything illegal or twisted, just curiosity. I'm a tech geek, and I've spent most of my life exploring every inch of the web I could find. I'd heard all the stories about the deep web and the dark web, those hidden layers beneath the internet we all know. Stories of drug markets, illegal auctions, and worse. I never really believed them, though. It seemed more like urban legend than reality. But one night, after a few too many beers and nothing better to do, I decided to check it out for myself. I found a Tor browser, set it up, and started poking around. At first, it was pretty boring, honestly. Lots of dead links, forums in languages I didn't understand and markets selling stuff that looked sketchy, but nothing crazy. Just as I was about to call it a night, I stumbled onto a forum that seemed different. It was called The Black Gate. Sounds ominous, right? The layout was basic, almost archaic, but there was something about it that felt wrong, like I shouldn't be there. The posts were all anonymous, and they talked about things that made my skin crawl. It wasn't just drugs or weapons, it was requests. People were asking for services, terrifying services. There were requests for accidents, permanent solutions, and other euphemisms that I didn't want to think too hard about. But one post stood out. It was a simple title, The Harvester. The body of the post was even more unnerving. It read, Guaranteed Results. No loose ends. Discretion assured. I know I should have closed the browser right then. I should have shut down my computer and gone to bed. But there was something about it that pulled me in. Maybe it was the alcohol. Or maybe it was just my own morbid curiosity. But I clicked on it. The post took me to another page. One that was just as bare bones as the forum. It had a black background with white text and there was no decoration, no graphics, just the words. There was a form at the bottom asking for details, the target's name, location, desired outcome, and a place to upload a photo. I didn't fill it out, obviously. I wasn't looking to hire anyone. I just wanted to see if it was real. So, like an idiot, I started reading the comments. They were all anonymous, but they didn't seem like typical internet trolls. These people sounded serious, like they'd done this before. One comment caught my eye. Success rate, 100%. If you need someone gone, the harvester delivers. I should have been freaked out. I should have been scared out of my mind, but instead, I was intrigued. I guess part of me didn't really believe it. I thought it was some kind of elaborate hoax, something designed to scare away the faint of heart. So I did the stupidest thing I could have done. I bookmarked the page. I didn't go back to it right away. Life got busy, and I forgot about it for a while. But then, about a week later, I found myself at home 
alone on a Saturday night, bored out of my mind. I'd already watched everything worth watching on Netflix, and there was nothing on YouTube that I hadn't seen a million times. That's when I remembered the Black Gate. I opened my bookmarks and clicked on the link. It took me back to the same page, the same dark, creepy page with that unsettling form. I don't know what I was expecting, but there was something different about it this time. It wasn't just the page, it was the way I felt. There was this weird sense of foreboding, like I was standing on the edge of a cliff and looking down into the abyss. Despite the growing sense of dread in my gut, I couldn't look away. I started clicking through more links, reading more comments, and that's when I saw it. A new post titled, Successful Harvests. It was a list, a long list of names, all in plain text. Next to each name was a location and a date. I recognized a few of the names. They were people who had gone missing in recent years, cases that were all over the news at one point. My heart started to race as I scrolled down, recognizing more and more names. This wasn't a hoax. This wasn't some messed up game. This was real, and I was in way over my head. I slammed my laptop shut, my heart pounding. My room was suddenly too quiet, too dark. I felt like I was being watched, like there was something in the shadows just waiting for me to slip up. I tried to laugh it off, telling myself it was just my imagination, but I couldn't shake the feeling. I couldn't sleep that night. Every creak, every little noise made me jump. I kept seeing those names in my head, kept thinking about the people they belonged to, people who were probably dead because of what I'd just seen. The next morning, I decided I was done. I wasn't going to mess around with the dark web anymore. It was too real, too dangerous. I deleted the Tor browser from my computer and tried to put the whole thing behind me. But as the days went by, I couldn't stop thinking about it. The list, the harvester, that feeling of being watched. Then, about a week after I deleted everything, I got an email. The subject line was blank and the sender was just a string of random numbers and letters. I almost deleted it without reading it, but something made me click on it. The email was only one sentence long. You shouldn't have looked. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. My hands started to shake as I reread the words over and over again. You shouldn't have looked. I didn't know what to do. I thought about going to the police, but what could I say? That I'd been poking around the dark web and found something I shouldn't have. They'd probably just laugh at me, or worse, think I was crazy. So, I did nothing. I deleted the email and tried to convince myself it was just some prank, some troll who'd gotten my email address. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. This was something else something serious. And then, things started happening. Small things at first. Things that were easy to brush off as coincidences. A car would park across the street from my apartment and stay there all day. My phone would ring, and when I answered, there was just silence on the other end. I'd see the same person at the grocery store or the coffee shop. Someone who seemed to always be just a little too close, always watching me out of the corner of their eye. I started to feel like I was losing my mind. I couldn't concentrate at work. I couldn't sleep. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, expecting to see someone following me. But no matter how paranoid I got, no matter how many times I checked, there was never anyone there. Just that feeling, that feeling of being watched. It was around this time that I started hearing the whispers. At first, I thought they were just in my head, a result of my sleep-deprived brain playing tricks on me. But they got louder, clearer, 
They weren't just random noises. They were words. My name. Over and over again, in a voice I didn't recognize. I know how this sounds. I know it sounds crazy. But I swear, it's real. I'm not imagining it. And then, last night, I got another email. This one was different. It had a subject line. Final notice. The body of the email was empty, except for one thing. An image attachment. With trembling hands, I clicked on the attachment, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was a picture of me, taken from across the street, through my living room window. It was from that night I was looking at the list. I recognized the clothes I was wearing, the way I was sitting at my desk, staring at my screen. They've been watching me this whole time, and now they've let me know. I don't know what to do. I'm scared to go to the police. I'm scared to leave my apartment. Hell, I'm scared to even look out the window. I don't know what these people want from me or why they're doing this, but I have this terrible feeling that it's only going to get worse. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can barely think straight. All I know is that I've got to get out of here but I don't know where to go or who to trust. I think I've made a terrible mistake, and I'm pretty sure I'm the next target. I didn't sleep at all after getting that last email. I spent the night pacing around my apartment, every sound amplified in the silence. My heart was a drumbeat in my ears, my nerves frayed to the point where I felt like I might snap. I kept looking out the window, expecting to see someone standing there, watching me, but there was nothing. Just the empty street, dimly lit by the flickering street lamp that seemed to struggle against the darkness. I couldn't stay there. I knew that much. Whatever this was, whoever these people were, they had found me. I needed to leave, to get as far away from my apartment as possible. Maybe if I could just disappear for a while, they'd forget about me, or at least lose interest. It was a weak plan, but it was all I had. I threw some clothes into a backpack, grabbed my laptop and phone, and headed out the door. My heart was pounding in my chest as I made my way down the stairs, every step echoing in the narrow hallway. I felt like I was being watched like someone was just waiting for me to make a wrong move. But the hallway was empty, just the usual chipped paint and flickering fluorescent lights. When I reached the street, I took a deep breath and forced myself to walk calmly to my car. I didn't look around, didn't check if anyone was following me. I didn't want to give them any reason to know I was scared. I just needed to get in my car and go. As I drove away, I tried to think of where I could go. I didn't want to go to a friend's house. They'd be too easy to find. Hotels were out too. They'd track my credit card. The only option was to keep driving, to get on the highway, and head out of town, as far as I could get before exhaustion caught up with me. I ended up on a highway that led out of the city the lights of the urban sprawl fading in my rearview mirror as I pushed the car faster and faster. I didn't have a destination, just a need to get away. The further I drove, the more my mind raced, replaying everything that had happened over the past few weeks. The website, the email, the picture. It all felt like a nightmare, something that couldn't possibly be real. But it was and I was trapped in it. Hours passed, and the night dragged on. The highway was deserted, just an endless stretch of asphalt, cutting through the darkness. My eyes started to droop, my body begging for sleep, but I couldn't stop. Not yet. Not until I was sure I was safe. But even then, I knew that feeling of safety might never come again. It was around 3 a.m., when I saw the sign for a rest stop. My eyes were burning from the lack of sleep, my head pounding. 
I couldn't go on like this. I needed to rest, even if it was just for a little while. The rest stop was small, just a parking lot and a few picnic tables, dimly lit by a couple of aging lamps. It was eerily quiet, the kind of place that would have given me the creeps any other time. But at that moment, I didn't care. I was too tired to care. I pulled into the farthest corner of the lot, away from the single car parked near the entrance, and turned off the engine. The silence was deafening, the darkness pressing in from all sides. I locked the doors and leaned back in my seat, telling myself I'd just close my eyes for a few minutes, just enough to clear my head. I don't know how long I slept, but when I woke up, it was still dark. My neck was stiff, my back aching from the awkward position I'd fallen asleep in. The first thing I noticed was the cold. It had seeped into the car, chilling me to the bone. The second thing I noticed was the fog. It had rolled in while I slept, blanketing the parking lot in a thick, soupy mist. The lamps barely cut through it, casting eerie, dim halos of light that only seemed to make the darkness deeper. I checked my phone. No messages, no calls, just a low battery warning. I hadn't been asleep for long, maybe an hour or two at most. But something had woken me. I sat up slowly, peering through the fogged up windows, trying to see what had pulled me from my uneasy sleep. But there was nothing. Just the empty parking lot and the dense fog beyond. I almost convinced myself it was nothing, that I was just paranoid, until I saw it. A shadow, barely visible in the fog, moving slowly towards my car. My breath caught in my throat as I watched it, my heart racing. The shape was indistinct, just a dark figure against the even darker night, but it was moving with purpose, getting closer with every passing second. I didn't wait to see who it was. I grabbed my keys, fumbled with the ignition, and turned the engine over. The sudden noise shattered the silence, and the figure froze just a few yards from my car. I didn't get a good look at it, but there was something about the way it stood there, something that sent a jolt of pure terror through me. I threw the car into reverse, my tires screeching as I backed out of the parking space. The figure didn't move, just stood there, watching as I spun the car around and sped out of the lot. My hands were shaking my vision blurry from panic and exhaustion, but I didn't stop. I didn't even look back until I was miles down the highway, the rest stop long behind me. When I finally dared to glance in the rearview mirror, there was nothing there, just the empty road and the thickening fog. I kept driving, the adrenaline pushing me through the night, but my mind was racing. Who or what? Had that been? Was it just some random person, another traveler, who'd stopped for a break? Or was it them? Had they found me already? I didn't know. And that uncertainty was worse than anything else. The fear of the unknown, of not knowing who was after me, or what they wanted, was eating me alive. The highway stretched on, endless and unforgiving. I didn't see another car for hours, didn't pass another rest stop. It was just me, the road, and the growing sense of dread that I couldn't shake. By the time the sky started to lighten with the first hints of dawn, I was on the verge of collapse. My hands were trembling on the steering wheel, my eyes red and bloodshot from lack of sleep. I needed to stop. I knew I couldn't go on like this, but I was terrified of what might happen if I did. Every time I closed my eyes, even for a second, I saw that shadowy figure standing in the fog, waiting for me. As the sun began to rise, painting the sky with pale pinks and oranges, I finally pulled off the highway 
into a small town. It was the kind of place that barely registered on the map. A cluster of old buildings and a gas station that looked like it hadn't been updated in decades. It was quiet, almost eerily so, but at least it was a place to rest, to catch my breath and figure out what the hell I was going to do next. I parked in front of a diner that looked like it had been plucked straight out of the 1950s. The neon sign in the window flickered weakly, and the place looked deserted, but it was open, and I needed coffee, something to keep me going. I got out of the car, my legs stiff and aching, and made my way inside. The bell above the door jingled as I entered, the sound unnaturally loud in the stillness. The diner was empty, just a row of old booths and a counter lined with faded stools. A single waitress stood behind the counter, wiping it down with a rag that looked like it had seen better days. She looked up as I approached, her eyes tired but kind. What can I get you, hun? She asked, her voice rough from years of smoking. Just coffee, I replied, trying to keep the fear out of my voice. Black. She nodded and poured me a cup from the pot behind the counter. I took a seat at one of the booths, my back to the wall so I could see the door. I didn't want to be caught off guard again. As I sipped the coffee, I tried to clear my mind to figure out what to do next. But no matter how hard I tried to think logically, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being hunted. That whoever or whatever I had seen in that rest stop was still out there, still coming for me. The waitress glanced at me every now and then, a curious look in her eyes, like she could tell something was wrong. But she didn't ask, and I was grateful for that. I wasn't sure I could explain it, even if I wanted to. I sat there for what felt like hours, nursing my coffee and watching the door. The morning rush never came. The town seemed dead, almost like I'd driven into a ghost town without realizing it, but that was fine by me. The fewer people around, the less likely it was that I'd be found. Eventually, the sun was fully up, casting long shadows across the street outside. I knew I couldn't stay there forever. I needed to keep moving, to stay ahead of whatever was after me. But where could I go? How could I escape something I couldn't even see? Something that could be anyone, anywhere. I paid for the coffee and left a generous tip, hoping it would make the waitress forget my tired, haunted face. Then I got back in my car and pulled out onto the empty street. I was about to turn back onto the highway when I noticed something in the rearview mirror. A flash of movement just at the edge of my vision. My heart skipped a beat, and I whipped my head around, searching for the source. But there was nothing. Just the empty street and the silent buildings. Maybe it was my imagination. Maybe I was just paranoid, seeing things that weren't there. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. That whoever had sent those emails, whoever had taken that picture of me, wasn't far behind. I didn't know how much longer I could keep running, but I didn't have a choice. So I hit the gas and drove, the shadow of fear growing darker with every mile. As the day wore on, I found myself driving through a landscape that felt more surreal with each passing mile. The world outside my window seemed to blur, a monotonous stretch of road that twisted and turned through small towns and endless fields. It was as if I was driving through a dream, a haze that dulled my senses and made it hard to think clearly. The only thing that remained sharp was the fear gnawing at the edges of my mind, the certainty that I was being hunted. The further I drove, the more isolated I became. The towns grew smaller, more sparse, until eventually, I wasn't passing through towns at all, just clusters of dilapidated buildings, 
long abandoned and overtaken by weeds. My gas gauge hovered dangerously close to empty, but I couldn't bring myself to stop. Stopping meant staying in one place, and staying in one place meant giving them a chance to catch up. I couldn't let that happen, but eventually I didn't have a choice. The needle hit empty, and I found myself coasting into a tiny gas station on the side of a forgotten road. The place looked like it hadn't seen customers in years. The pumps were old, the kind with spinning numbers behind glass, and the building itself was a sad, sagging structure that might have once been white, but now looked more like a dirty grey. I pulled up to the pump and got out, the hot, dry air hitting me like a wall. There was no one around, no cars, no people, just the oppressive silence of the midday heat. I reached for the pump handle, half expecting it to be dry, but to my surprise, the old machine sputtered to life and I started to fill up my tank. As I stood there, the gas trickling slowly into my car, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. It wasn't just the isolation, the emptiness of the place. It was something else, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I kept looking around, scanning the horizon for any sign of movement, but there was nothing. Just the endless stretch of road, the barren fields, and the distant outline of trees. Then, just as I was finishing up, I heard it, a low mechanical whirring, like the sound of an engine approaching. My heart leapt into my throat as I turned towards the road, my eyes narrowing against the glare of the sun. At first, I couldn't see anything, just the shimmering heat waves rising off the asphalt. But then, in the distance, I saw it, a black car, sleek and unmarked, speeding down the road towards me. I dropped the pump handle, my pulse skyrocketing as I scrambled back into my car. The black car was getting closer, moving faster than anything else on that desolate road should have been. My hand shook as I turned the key in the ignition, praying that my engine would start. It did, but just barely, coughing to life as I slammed the car into gear and pulled away from the pump. As I sped out of the gas station, the black car followed, its headlights glinting in the sun. I didn't need to look back to know it was them. I could feel it in my gut, the cold certainty that whoever was driving that car had been sent for me. The harvester's shadow was closing in. The road ahead twisted and turned through the empty countryside, and I pushed my car to its limits, the engine roaring as I tried to put as much distance between me and the black car as possible. But no matter how fast I went, the car stayed with me, matching my every move. It was like a predator toying with its prey, letting me think I had a chance before closing in for the kill. My mind raced as I tried to think of a plan, something, anything that could get me out of this. But there was nothing. No towns, no side roads, no place to hide. Just the endless stretch of highway and the relentless black car behind me. I was trapped. I was nearing a blind curve when the black car suddenly accelerated, pulling up alongside me. For a brief, terrifying moment, I caught a glimpse of the driver, a man in a black suit, his face hidden behind dark sunglasses. He looked at me, just for a second, and in that moment, I knew that this was no ordinary pursuit. This was something far more sinister. Before I could react, the black car swerved towards me, forcing me off the road. My tires screeched as I fought to regain control, but it was too late. My car spun out, skidding across the gravel shoulder and slamming into a ditch. The impact knocked the wind out of me, and for a few seconds, all I could do was sit there, dazed and disoriented but I didn't have time to recover. I heard the sound of the black car's door opening, 
the crunch of gravel underfoot as the driver approached. Panic surged through me, and I fumbled with my seatbelt, desperate to get out. I couldn't stay in the car, nor with them coming. I shoved the door open and stumbled out, my legs unsteady beneath me. The world spun as I tried to get my bearings, but there was no time. The driver was almost on me, a shadowy figure silhouetted against the blinding sun. I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. I bolted across the field, the dry grass whipping against my legs as I fled. I didn't know where I was going, just that I needed to get as far away from the road as possible. Behind me, I heard the driver shout, his voice cold and emotionless, but I didn't look back. I couldn't afford to. My only chance was to keep running, to put distance between us. The field was endless, stretching out in every direction with no cover, no place to hide. But I kept running, fueled by sheer terror and adrenaline. My lungs burned, my muscles screamed in protest but I didn't stop. Not until I reached the tree line at the edge of the field. I crashed through the underbrush, the branches scratching at my skin as I plunged into the forest. The trees closed in around me, their shadows deep and menacing, but I kept going, my breath ragged and uneven. I could still hear the driver behind me, his footsteps growing closer with each passing second. I stumbled over roots, my feet slipping on the loose earth. But I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. I was too close now, too close to escape, or to being caught. The forest seemed to stretch on forever, an endless maze of trees and shadows. But I kept running, praying that I could outrun whatever nightmare was chasing me. But then, just as I thought I might have a chance, I heard it. A second set of footsteps, coming from the direction I was running. I skidded to a halt, my heart hammering in my chest as I realized what it meant. They had me surrounded. I spun around, searching for a way out, but there was none. The footsteps were closing in from both sides, the shadows deepening around me. I was trapped in the middle of the forest, with no way to escape. Panic surged through me as I backed up against a tree, my breath coming in short, frantic gasps. This was it. They had me. The footsteps grew louder, more deliberate, and I could see them now. Two figures emerging from the shadows, both dressed in the same dark suits and sunglasses. They moved with an eerie precision, like predators closing in on their prey. Please, I gasped my voice barely a whisper. Please, don't. They didn't respond. They just kept coming, their faces expressionless, their eyes hidden behind those impenetrable lenses. There was no mercy in their movements, no hesitation. They were here to do a job, and I was the target. My mind raced, searching for something, anything that could save me, but there was nothing. I was out of options, out of time. Then, just as they were about to reach me, something changed. The air around me grew colder, the shadows deepening until they were almost solid. The figures slowed, their movements becoming sluggish, almost like they were walking through water. I didn't understand what was happening, but I didn't care. I took the opportunity to slip away, darting between the trees and back into the forest. I could hear the figures behind me, their footsteps now frantic, but they were slower, their pursuit less determined. It was as if something was holding them back, something unseen. I ran until I couldn't run anymore, until my legs gave out and I collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath. The forest was silent around me, the shadows still and unmoving. I lay there for what felt like hours, my heart racing, waiting for the footsteps to return, for the figures to find me, but they never did. 
when I finally mustered the strength to stand, the sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows through the trees. I was alone. The figures were gone, and so was the sense of impending doom that had hung over me for so long. But I knew better than to think I was safe. They might have let me go this time, but they wouldn't stop. They never stopped, and I had no idea why they hadn't caught me, why they had slowed down at the last moment. As I made my way through the forest, the trees slowly giving way to open ground, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. But this time, it wasn't by the figures in black. It was something else, something older, more primal, something that had saved me, but for a price. I didn't know what that price was yet, but I knew it was coming, and I wasn't sure if I was ready to pay it. The forest had an eerie stillness about it, as I stumbled out into the clearing, my legs trembling with exhaustion. The sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving the sky a dull, bruised purple, and the first stars were beginning to peek through the thin veil of twilight. But the darkness didn't bring relief. If anything, it made the weight on my chest heavier, the sense of dread more oppressive. I should have felt some kind of victory, some small measure of relief after escaping those men, but instead I felt an overwhelming sense of unease. The forest, which should have been a sanctuary, felt alive in a way that I couldn't explain like it was watching me, waiting for something. I kept moving, too scared to stop, too terrified to stay in one place. As I made my way through the underbrush, my thoughts kept circling back to those final moments in the woods when everything had shifted. The air had grown cold, the shadows had deepened, and those men, those relentless hunters, had slowed down almost as if they were being held back by something unseen. It didn't make sense. Why had they let me go? What had changed? I couldn't shake the feeling that it hadn't been luck, or even my own desperate will to survive, that had saved me. Something else had intervened, something I couldn't understand. And now, it felt like that something was following me, its presence just out of sight, lurking in the dark corners of my mind. I was lost in these thoughts when I saw it. A small, run-down cabin nestled in the trees. The wood was weathered and grey, the roof sagging under years of neglect. It looked abandoned, but the thin wisp of smoke curling from the chimney told me otherwise. My first instinct was to avoid it, to keep moving through the forest but the exhaustion was too much. I needed rest, even if it was just for a few minutes. I approached the cabin cautiously, every step tentative, my ears straining for any sound that might indicate I wasn't alone. But there was nothing, just the rustle of the wind through the trees and the occasional creak of the old wood. When I reached the door, I hesitated, my hand hovering over the handle. This place felt wrong, like it shouldn't exist, like it was a relic from another time, another world. But I had nowhere else to go. The door creaked loudly as I pushed it open, the sound echoing through the small, dimly lit interior. The cabin was just as run down inside as it was outside, with a single, battered table and two mismatched chairs in the center of the room. A small fire crackled in the stone fireplace, casting flickering shadows on the rough-hewn walls. But what drew my attention immediately was the figure sitting at the table, hunched over as if in deep thought. It was an old man, his face lined with deep wrinkles, his eyes hidden beneath the brim of a tattered hat. He didn't look up as I entered, didn't acknowledge me at all. He just sat there, staring at something on the table in front of him. I took a cautious step forward, and that's when I saw 
what he was looking at. A deck of old, worn cards laid out in a pattern I didn't recognize. Come in, he said suddenly, his voice low and gravelly, as if he'd been expecting me all along. Sit down. Every instinct I had screamed at me to leave, to turn and run back into the forest, but something in the way he spoke rooted me to the spot. I moved towards the table as if in a trance, my body acting on its own, and slid into the chair across from him. Up close, I could see that his eyes were cloudy, almost milky white as if he were blind, but there was a sharpness to them, a sense that he could see far more than I could. For a long moment, we just sat there in silence, the only sound the crackling of the fire and the soft rustle of the cards as he shuffled them with practiced ease. Finally, he looked up at me, his gaze piercing, and I felt like he could see straight into my soul. You've come a long way, he said, his tone cryptic, his words heavy with meaning, and you've crossed paths with things you shouldn't have. I swallowed hard, my mouth dry. Who are you? He didn't answer immediately. Instead, he began laying the cards out on the table, one by one, face down. When he was finished, he leaned back in his chair and regarded me with an unreadable expression. Names don't matter here, he said finally. What matters is the debt that's been incurred. I frowned, my heart pounding in my chest. Debt? I don't understand. You will, he replied, his voice calm, almost soothing. You've been touched by the darkness, drawn into something far older and more dangerous than you can imagine. And now, it's claimed you. The air in the cabin grew colder, the shadows deepening, as if his words had summoned something malevolent. I felt a chill run down my spine and I had to resist the urge to bolt from the table. But I couldn't move. I was trapped, caught in the web of whatever this was. What do you mean? I asked, my voice trembling. What do you want from me? The old man didn't answer right away. Instead, he reached out and flipped over the first card in the pattern. It was an image of a man bound in chains, his face twisted in agony. I felt a jolt of fear as I stared at it, the image searing itself into my mind. You've made a bargain, the old man said, his voice low and almost mournful. Not with words, but with your actions. You called out for help, and something answered. Now, it's come to collect. A cold sweat broke out on my forehead as I realized what he was saying. I hadn't meant to make any bargains. I'd just been trying to survive, to escape. But in my desperation, in my fear, I'd somehow invoked something, something that had saved me from the men in black. But now, that something wanted payment. What? What do I have to do? I whispered, my throat tight with terror. The old man flipped over another card. This one showed a figure standing at a crossroads a path leading into darkness on one side, and light on the other. His eyes met mine, and I felt a heavy weight settle in my chest. You have a choice, he said softly. You can give yourself to the darkness, let it consume you, and your suffering will end. Or you can fight it, resist, and walk a path that's far more dangerous. But know this, the darkness never lets go easily. It will hunt you, torment you, until you're either consumed or destroyed. I stared at the cards, my mind racing. Neither option was appealing. One led to oblivion, the other to endless fear and pain. But what choice did I have? The shadows had already closed in around me, and I was too deep to turn back. As if sensing my thoughts, the old man flipped over the final card. It was blank, just an empty, white space where an image should have been. He looked at me, his expression grave. The final choice is yours, he said. 
The path ahead is uncertain. The darkness may claim you, or you may find a way to escape. But remember, every step you take, every decision you make, will determine your fate. I sat there staring at the blank card, my mind spinning with the implications. The darkness was real. It was hunting me, and it had already saved me once. But at what cost? What kind of life would I have if I continued to run, to fight against something I couldn't even see? But the alternative, giving in, letting it take me. I couldn't do that. Not yet. There had to be another way. There had to be some way out of this nightmare. I looked up at the old man, my resolve hardening. I'll fight, I said my voice firmer than I felt. I'm not ready to give up. He nodded, a small sad smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Then you must be ready for what's to come. The darkness is patient, but it is relentless. It will find you again, and when it does, you must be prepared. He gathered up the cards, shuffling them with slow, deliberate movements, as if sealing my fate with each pass of the deck. When he finished, he slid the cards back into his coat pocket and stood up. Go now, he said, his voice low and resonant. Leave this place and keep moving. But remember, the price of survival is steep, and it's a price that must be paid in full. I stood as well, my legs still shaky, but stronger now, bolstered by the decision I'd made. The old man turned and walked to the door, opening it wide to reveal the darkening forest beyond. I hesitated for a moment, then stepped out into the cool night air. As I walked away from the cabin, the shadows of the forest closing in around me once more, I felt a strange mix of fear and determination. The darkness was out there, waiting, biding its time, but so was I. I wouldn't let it take me without a fight. And as I disappeared into the trees, I couldn't shake the feeling that the real battle had only just begun. The night was suffocating, the darkness pressing in from all sides as I moved through the forest. The trees seemed to close ranks around me, their branches twisting together to form a dense, impenetrable canopy that blocked out the stars. My footsteps were muffled by the thick layer of leaves and moss underfoot, and the only sound was the faint rustle of the wind through the trees, an uneasy, restless sound that set my nerves on edge. I knew I had to keep moving. The old man's words echoed in my mind, urging me onward, but the weight of what I had chosen to do was beginning to bear down on me. I was exhausted, my body screaming for rest, but there was no rest to be found here. Not when the darkness was still out there, waiting, watching. It was a cold, gnawing fear that had settled into my bones, the kind that doesn't let go, that burrows deep and festers. I knew it wasn't just the men in black who were after me anymore. They were a symptom, not the cause. The real danger, the real threat, was something much older, much darker, and it was closing in. As I pushed deeper into the forest, the air grew colder, sharper, and the wind began to pick up, howling through the trees like a pack of hungry wolves. The shadows around me seemed to grow thicker, darker, as if the night itself was alive and conspiring to swallow me whole. My breath came in ragged gasps, each one visible in the icy air, and I knew I was running out of time. I wasn't sure how long I had been walking when I saw it, a clearing up ahead, bathed in an eerie, unnatural light that seemed to come from nowhere. The trees parted to reveal a small circular space, the ground covered in a carpet of dead leaves that crunched underfoot as I stepped into it. In the center of the clearing stood a single ancient oak tree, its gnarled branches reaching out like twisted fingers. There was something wrong about the tree, something deeply unsettling. 
Its bark was blackened, charred, as if it had been struck by lightning, but there were no signs of fire or scorch marks on the ground around it. The tree was dead, but it stood tall and imposing, as if it had been waiting for me. And then I saw them, the figures standing in the shadows at the edge of the clearing. There were three of them, dressed in the same dark suits and sunglasses as the men who had chased me before. But these figures were different. They were taller, their limbs unnaturally long, their faces obscured by the darkness. I couldn't make out any details, just a vague impression of something inhuman, something that didn't belong in this world. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as they stepped forward their movements slow and deliberate. They didn't speak, didn't make a sound, but I could feel their gaze on me, cold and merciless. The old man's warning rang in my ears. This was the darkness that had come to collect. The air in the clearing grew heavy, oppressive, and I could feel the weight of their presence pressing down on me, suffocating me. My legs felt like lead, my body frozen in place as they closed in. The ancient oak tree loomed behind them, its shadow stretching out like a dark omen. This was it. This was the end. I had run as far as I could, fought as hard as I could, but the darkness had found me. There was no escape now, no way out. All I could do was face it, whatever it was, and hope that I could somehow survive. The figures stopped a few feet away from me, their faces still hidden in shadow. The air crackled with tension, the silence so thick it was almost tangible. And then, without warning, the figure in the center spoke. You cannot escape what you've summoned, it said, its voice a low guttural growl that seemed to vibrate through the air. The darkness has claimed you. You belong to us now. The words sent a shiver down my spine, a cold, paralyzing fear that rooted me to the spot. I wanted to scream, to run, but I couldn't. All I could do was stare at them, my mind racing as I tried to make sense of what was happening. I had made a bargain unintentionally, but a bargain nonetheless. I had called out for help in my moment of desperation, and something had answered something ancient, something dark, and now it had come to collect its due. But as I stood there, paralyzed by fear, a small spark of defiance flared up inside me. I hadn't come this far just to give up. I had fought tooth and nail to survive, to escape the nightmare that had consumed my life, and I wasn't about to surrender now. I took a deep breath, forcing myself to speak, even though my voice shook with terror. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want any of this. The figure in the center tilted its head, as if considering my words. Intent is irrelevant, it replied, its voice cold and emotionless. You called, and we answered. The pact has been sealed. My mind raced, searching for a way out, some loophole, some escape. There has to be another way, I said, desperation creeping into my voice. I'll do anything. Just, just let me go. The figures were silent for a long moment, and I could feel their gaze boring into me, weighing my words. Finally, the figure in the center spoke again. There is one way, it said, its voice softer now, almost a whisper. A sacrifice. The darkness must be fed, a life for a life. If you offer another in your place, we will release you. The words hit me like a physical blow, the implications sinking in like a stone in my gut. They wanted me to sacrifice someone else, to trade their life for mine. The darkness wasn't just after me. It wanted to consume, to destroy, and it was offering me a way out a way to survive, but at a terrible cost. I couldn't do it. I knew that. 
deep down, I couldn't condemn someone else to this fate, no matter how scared I was, no matter how desperate I was to live. But if I didn't, if I didn't, the darkness would take me, it would consume me, and I would be lost forever. Tears welled up in my eyes as I grappled with the impossible choice, the weight of it crushing me. I was trapped, cornered, with no good options, no way to win. But I had to choose, and I had to choose now. I... I can't, I whispered, my voice breaking. I can't do that to someone else. The figure in the center tilted its head again, as if considering my answer. The silence stretched on, heavy and unbearable, until finally it spoke once more. Then you will face the darkness alone, it said, its voice filled with finality. But know this, you have sealed your fate. The darkness will consume you, piece by piece, until nothing remains. The words echoed in the clearing, the finality of them settling over me like a shroud. The figures stepped back, melting into the shadows, and I felt the air grow colder, the darkness pressing in around me. But I didn't run. I didn't scream. I just stood there, accepting what was to come. I had made my choice, and I would face the consequences, alone. The shadows closed in, the air growing thick and heavy, and I felt the first tendrils of the darkness wrapping around me, pulling me down into the abyss. It was cold, so cold, and I could feel my strength fading, my mind slipping away into the black void. But as I succumbed to the darkness, one thought remained, a small, defiant spark that refused to be extinguished. I would fight, I would resist, until the very end. I would not go quietly into the dark, and as the world faded to black, as the last remnants of light disappeared, I knew one thing for certain. The darkness had won this round, but the battle was far from over. I uploaded my DNA to a dark web database. Now someone's making clones of me. I guess this is where I start. I'm not sure if I'm looking for advice or just trying to get this off my chest, but I've been carrying this weight for too long and it's starting to feel like it's crushing me. I'm not some paranoid conspiracy theorist. I'm just a regular guy who made a really, really stupid decision. So a few months ago, I was in a pretty rough place. I lost my job, my relationship was on the rocks, and I was running low on cash. You know that feeling when life just keeps kicking you down and you're desperate for anything that might give you a break. Yeah, that was me. I'd heard about making money online and I was willing to try anything. I was already familiar with some of the sketchier parts of the internet. Nothing too crazy but I dipped my toes in the deep web a few times out of curiosity. It was mostly just weird chat rooms, some forums with people ranting about stuff that didn't really make sense to me. I never really got involved in anything, just lurked around. One night, I came across this post on a dark web forum. It was in one of those hidden threads that you have to dig through layers of nonsense to find. The title was vague, something like, make easy money, no questions asked. I know, I know, it screams scam, but like I said, I was desperate. The post was oddly professional looking, which stood out because most of the stuff on these forums is a mess of typos and broken English. It talked about this new, biotech startup that was looking for volunteers for a genetic database. They needed DNA samples for research, and they were paying really well for it. Like, insanely well. We're talking enough money to cover my rent for a few months, and maybe even give me a little breathing room to figure things out. The instructions were simple. They'd send you a kit. You'd swab your cheek and mail it back. 
Once they confirmed they got your sample, the money would be wired to a crypto wallet they provided. There was no mention of what the research was about, no legal mumbo jumbo, just a straightforward transaction. The whole thing felt off, but at the time, the idea of easy money was all I could think about. Against my better judgment, I went for it. I set up a new email, made sure my VPN was on, and replied to the post. Within an hour, I got a response. They asked for my mailing address. Again, not my real one, just a P.O. box I had, and a confirmation that I was ready to proceed. I replied, yes, and that was it. A few days later, the kit arrived. The kit itself was basic, but legit looking, like something you'd get from 23 and me or Ancestry DNA. There was a sterile swab, a little tube to put it in, and a prepaid envelope. The instructions were clear. Swab the inside of your cheek, put it in the tube, seal it, and mail it back. So I did it. The whole thing took maybe five minutes, and then it was out of my hands. I mailed the sample off and forgot about it for a while. I didn't expect to hear back, honestly. I figured if it was a scam, I'd never see the money, and that would be the end of it. But about a week later, I checked the crypto wallet they gave me, and sure enough, there was the payment. The money was real, and it was more than enough to get me out of the hole I was in. For a while, things started looking up. I used the money to cover my bills, get back on my feet, and even treat myself to a few things I hadn't been able to afford in a long time. It felt like I'd finally caught a break, but then weird stuff started happening. At first, it was small things, like I'd get this strange feeling that I was being watched. You know when you're alone, but you can't shake the feeling that someone's standing right behind you. It was like that. I'd chalk it up to paranoia or stress and move on, but the feeling didn't go away. It just got stronger. Then one night, I got a text from an unknown number. It was just a single word. Thank you. I stared at my phone for a long time, trying to figure out who could have sent it, but there was no name, no clue. Just, thank you. I tried to ignore it, but the next day, I got another one. This time, it said, we'll be in touch. At this point, I was starting to get seriously creeped out. I didn't respond to the texts, but they kept coming. You've been helpful. We're almost ready. See you soon. Each one was more unsettling than the last, and I had no idea what they meant or who was sending them. I tried to put it out of my mind, convincing myself it was just some weird prank. Maybe someone had hacked my number or something, but then something happened that I couldn't ignore. I was walking home one night, just a normal evening, nothing unusual. But as I was passing by this alley, I saw someone standing in the shadows. At first, I thought it was just some random person, but then they stepped into the light. And that's when I froze, because the person I was staring at was me. My heart nearly stopped when I saw him, me, standing there in the alley. I'm not talking about some guy who looked like me. I mean, he was exactly me. Same height, same build, same face, even the same damn jacket I was wearing. It was like looking into a mirror, but the reflection wasn't where it was supposed to be. For a split second, I thought maybe I was having some kind of mental breakdown. I'd been stressed, sure, but this was on another level. The logical part of my brain was trying to convince me that this was impossible, that I was seeing things, but the other part, the part that was screaming at me to run, was winning. I didn't move. I couldn't. My feet were glued to the sidewalk, my eyes locked onto his. He didn't say anything, didn't even smile. He just stared at me 
with this cold, empty look, like he was studying me. And then, in one smooth motion, he turned and walked deeper into the alley, disappearing into the shadows. I should have run in the opposite direction, but something pulled me forward. Maybe it was curiosity, maybe it was fear, or maybe it was that deep down human instinct that makes you want to know what's really going on, even when you know it's better not to. So I followed him. The alley was dark, the only light coming from a flickering street lamp at the far end. The walls were covered in graffiti, the kind that looks like it's been there for years. Trash littered the ground, and the smell of rot hung in the air. It was the kind of place where bad things happen, where you'd expect to find trouble, but nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. The alley didn't just end in a dead end like I thought it would. Instead, it opened up into this old abandoned warehouse, one of those massive brick buildings that had probably been shut down for decades. The door was ajar, and inside, I could see a faint light. It was dim, almost like candlelight, and it cast these long, eerie shadows on the walls. I hesitated for a moment at the threshold, the small part of me screaming to turn around, to forget all of this and go home. But that other part, the part that was now gripped by a morbid curiosity, pushed me forward. I stepped inside. The air was thick and musty, like the place hadn't been touched in years. The walls were lined with rusting machinery, old conveyor belts, and tools that looked like they belonged in a museum. But what caught my eye was the center of the room. There was a table, long and metal, and on it, well, it's hard to even describe, laid out on the table were these things. They looked like mannequins at first, white and plastic, but as I got closer, I realized they weren't mannequins at all. They were bodies, human bodies, but they weren't quite right. Their skin was too pale, almost translucent, and their features were slightly off, like someone had tried to recreate a human from memory, but had never actually seen one before. I could feel my stomach turning, my heart pounding in my chest. There were six of them, each one at a different stage of development, I guess you'd call it. Some were almost fully formed, while others were just these grotesque, half-finished things, their limbs twisted and incomplete. But the worst part, every single one of them had my face. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Clones. They were clones of me. It didn't make any sense. But there they were, lying on that table, like some kind of sick science experiment. I started backing away, my hands shaking, my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. I needed to get out of there, to get away from this nightmare. But as I turned to leave, I heard something, a faint rustling sound coming from the far corner of the room. I turned, and that's when I saw him again. The other me. He was standing in the shadows, just out of reach of the light, watching me with those same cold, dead eyes. But this time, he wasn't alone. There were others, five or six of them, all with my face, all watching me. They moved in unison, stepping out of the darkness and into the dim light of the warehouse. And then, slowly, they began to spread out, circling me like predators closing in on their prey. Panic surged through me, and I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. I bolted for the door, my footsteps echoing through the empty warehouse. But as I reached the exit, I felt a hand grab my arm, cold and firm, yanking me back. I spun around, ready to fight, but there was no one there, just that empty, dark alley stretching out before me. My arm was burning where I'd felt the grip, and I could still hear the faint echoes 
of footsteps behind me, getting closer. But when I turned to look, the alley was empty. I ran home that night, not stopping until I was inside my apartment. The door locked and bolted behind me. My heart was still racing, my mind reeling from what I'd seen. I wanted to believe it was some kind of hallucination, that maybe I'd been dreaming or losing my mind, but deep down I knew it was real. That night I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes I saw them, the clones, staring at me with those empty, lifeless eyes. I kept checking my phone, half expecting another text, but nothing came. The silence was almost worse than the messages. I kept telling myself that I was safe, that they couldn't find me here. But then, around 3 a.m., I heard something that made my blood run cold. Someone was knocking on my door. The knock on my door was soft, almost polite, but it sent a shockwave of fear through me. My first instinct was to ignore it, to pretend I wasn't there. But something about the way it echoed in the silence of my apartment made that impossible. It wasn't just a random late night visitor. I knew deep down that it was them. I sat there in my darkened living room, barely breathing, hoping whoever or whatever was on the other side would just go away. But the knocking continued, each tap more insistent, more demanding. It wasn't frantic or angry, but steady, like they had all the time in the world and knew I'd eventually have to answer. I grabbed the nearest thing I could find, a baseball bat I kept by the couch, and slowly, as quietly as I could, moved toward the door. My heart was pounding in my chest so loud I was sure they could hear it. The knocking stopped just as I reached the door, replaced by an unnerving silence. I stood there, bat in hand, staring at the door like it was about to burst open any second. My hand hovered over the doorknob, trembling, as I debated what to do. Should I open it? Call the cops? Run? But before I could make a decision, something slipped under the door. Something small and white. I jumped back, nearly dropping the bat, but it was just a piece of paper. A folded piece of paper, yellowed and crinkled like it had been handled a hundred times. I stared at it for what felt like an eternity, the silence in my apartment now deafening. Finally, I bent down and picked it up. My hands were shaking so bad that I almost tore it in half as I unfolded it. The paper was blank except for a single sentence, written in neat, precise handwriting. Are you ready to meet your maker? My blood ran cold. I don't know what I was expecting, but it definitely wasn't that. What did it even mean? Who was my maker? The people who made those clones? The clones themselves? My mind was spiraling into a thousand different dark places, none of them good. Then I heard it, the doorknob slowly turning. My breath caught in my throat as I watched it twist the sound of metal against metal, grating in the silence. It was so slow, so deliberate, like whoever was on the other side wanted me to know they could get in any time they wanted. Without thinking, I lunged forward and threw the deadbolt. The knob stopped turning instantly, and for a moment, there was nothing but the sound of my own ragged breathing. Then from the other side of the door, I heard a voice. We don't want to hurt you. The voice was my voice, but it wasn't coming from inside my head. It was outside, just beyond the door. It was soft, calm, almost reassuring, but hearing it made my skin crawl. We just want to talk, the voice continued, still calm, still me. We're the same, you and I. We share the same blood, the same thoughts, the same desires. You're not alone. I backed away from the door, gripping the bat so hard my knuckles were white. The voice on the other side chuckled softly, like it knew how terrified I was. 
You shouldn't have run from us. We could have helped you. We still can. There was a pause, and then I heard the faint sound of footsteps, like they were pacing back and forth in the hallway. We're stronger together, the voice said, this time with a hint of something darker, more insistent. We were meant to be one. I didn't respond. I couldn't. I was too terrified to even think straight. All I could do was back further into my apartment, away from that door, away from the voice that shouldn't exist, but somehow did. Then suddenly, the knocking started again, faster this time, more urgent. It was like they, or he, was getting impatient. The sound echoed through the apartment, filling every corner with its relentless rhythm. I felt like I was going to snap, like my mind was unraveling with each tap. We can make this easy, the voice said, still outside, but now there was an edge to it, something sharp and threatening beneath the calm. Or we can make it hard, it's up to you. I knew I couldn't stay there, couldn't keep listening to that voice, that thing on the other side of my door. My thoughts were racing, trying to find a way out, a way to escape. But the only way out was the door, and I wasn't going anywhere near it. Then something happened that I wasn't expecting. The knocking stopped. The silence returned, thick and suffocating, and for a moment I thought maybe they'd finally left. But that hope was short-lived, because that's when I heard the window in the kitchen slide open. I froze, my blood turning to ice. The kitchen window was small, barely big enough for someone to fit through, but I hadn't locked it. I never locked it, because I lived on the second floor, and I never thought anyone would try to come through it. But now, I could hear the soft creak of the window sliding up, followed by the unmistakable sound of someone climbing inside. I was trapped. There was no way out, no place to run. They, or it, was inside my apartment. I clutched the bat tighter, backing into the corner of the living room, my eyes fixed on the doorway to the kitchen. My mind was screaming at me to move, to do something, but my body wouldn't listen. I was paralyzed with fear, my heart thudding so hard in my chest it hurt. The footsteps were slow, deliberate, as they moved from the kitchen into the hallway. They weren't rushing, weren't running. They knew I had nowhere to go, and they were taking their time, savoring the moment. Then the footsteps stopped. I held my breath, straining to hear, but all I got was silence. It was like they were waiting, listening, maybe even enjoying the fear radiating off me. And then, finally, I saw him. The other me. He stepped into the living room, his face half in shadow, half illuminated by the dim light filtering through the blinds. He looked exactly like me, down to the last detail, except for one thing. His eyes. They were empty, hollow, soulless, like something was missing, something vital that made a person human. And when he smiled, it was the most unnatural, unnerving thing I'd ever seen, like his face wasn't used to making that expression. Why are you so afraid? He asked, his voice calm and smooth. My voice, but twisted into something unrecognizable. We're the same. You have nothing to fear. I tried to speak, to say something, anything, but no words came out. I just stood there, bat in hand, shaking like a leaf as he took another step closer. We're going to fix this, he said, his voice soft but laced with something sinister. We're going to make you whole. I don't know what happened next. Maybe it was the adrenaline finally kicking in, or maybe it was pure survival instinct, but I swung the bat as hard as I could. I didn't aim, didn't think, just swung, and I felt it connect with something solid. There was a sickening thud, and the other me staggered back, his head snapping to the side. But he didn't fall. He just stood there, 
his head tilted at an unnatural angle, that same eerie smile still plastered on his face. You can't fight this, he said, his voice slightly distorted now, like something had broken inside him. We're inevitable, but I wasn't listening. I swung the bat again and again, each time with more force, more desperation, and finally, with a final bone-crunching blow, he fell. But as he hit the floor, something even more horrifying happened. His body didn't stay still. It started to dissolve, melting away like wax in a fire, leaving behind nothing but a dark, sticky residue on the floor. I dropped the bat, backing away in horror, my mind struggling to comprehend what I'd just seen. But there was no time to process it, no time to think, because from the hallway I heard more footsteps, and I realized, with a sinking dread, that there were more of them, more of me, and they were coming. I didn't have time to think. The sound of footsteps, identical to mine, echoed from the hallway, growing louder with each passing second. My heart was pounding in my ears, drowning out everything else. I knew I had to move, but my body felt heavy, like I was stuck in a nightmare where every motion was agonizingly slow. I grabbed the bat again, my hands slick with sweat, and stumbled toward the nearest door, my bedroom. It wasn't much of a plan, but I needed to put something between me and whatever was coming. I slammed the door shut behind me and wedged a chair under the handle, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The room was dark, the only light coming from the street lamp outside, filtering weakly through the curtains. I backed away from the door, trying to quiet my breathing, my heart, anything that might give away my position. The bat felt like a lifeline in my hands, but deep down I knew it wouldn't be enough. For a moment there was nothing but silence, then the doorknob began to turn slowly, deliberately, like they were testing it. I pressed my back against the wall, as far from the door as I could get, my mind racing with every horrible possibility. The chair under the handle creaked, straining against the pressure, but it held, for now, a voice. My voice came from the other side, muffled but still clear enough to send chills down my spine. You can't hide forever, it said, soft and coaxing, like a parent trying to draw a frightened child out of hiding. We're meant to be together. You know that, don't you? The door rattled again, harder this time, and I heard the chair shift slightly, the wood scraping against the floor. I had to do something, anything, but my options were limited. My eyes darted around the room landing on the window. It was the only way out. Without wasting another second, I rushed to the window and pulled the curtains aside. The glass was cold under my fingers as I struggled to get it open, the old frame resisting my every effort. But adrenaline is a powerful thing, and eventually I managed to force it up. The cool night air hit my face, a brief, strange comfort in the midst of the chaos. But as I looked down, my stomach dropped. I was two stories up, and the ground below was nothing but unforgiving pavement. I didn't have time to think, though. There was a loud crack behind me, and I turned to see the door splintering as they, or it, pushed harder, the chair barely holding. I had to make a choice. It wasn't much of one, really. Stay and face whatever was trying to get in, or take my chances with the fall. I hesitated for only a split second before throwing one leg over the windowsill, gripping the frame with one hand while holding the bat in the other. My hands were shaking so badly I almost lost my grip, but I managed to swing my other leg out and dangle over the edge. The door behind me burst open just as I let go. For a terrifying moment, I was in free fall, 
the ground rushing up to meet me. I hit the pavement hard, the impact sending a jolt of pain through my entire body. My vision blurred, spots dancing before my eyes, but I didn't have time to lie there and take stock of my injuries. I forced myself up, gasping for breath, and looked up at the window. They were there, peering down at me. Their faces were shrouded in shadow, but I could feel their eyes on me, cold and calculating, and then, as if they had rehearsed it, they all smiled, that same unnatural, twisted smile that didn't belong on a human face, didn't belong on my face. I didn't wait to see what they'd do next. I started running, the bat still clutched in my hand like it was some kind of shield. I had no idea where I was going, only that I needed to get as far away from there as possible. The streets were empty, eerily quiet, like the whole city was holding its breath. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what had happened. How many of them were there? How had they found me so quickly? And most terrifying of all, what did they want with me? I turned corner after corner, not daring to look back, my legs burning with the effort to keep moving. The city felt like a labyrinth, each street blending into the next until I wasn't sure where I was anymore. I just kept running, hoping to find some place, any place where I could be safe. After what felt like hours, I found myself in front of an old rundown motel on the edge of town. The neon sign buzzed weakly, casting a sickly red glow over the parking lot. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. I staggered to the front office, my lungs burning, and banged on the door until an older man in a stained t-shirt finally opened it his face twisted in annoyance. What the hell do you want? He grumbled, eyeing me up and down with suspicion. I need a room, I gasped, reaching for my wallet, only to realize it was still in my apartment. Please, just... I can pay later, I promise. He looked like he was about to tell me to get lost, but something in my face must have changed his mind. Maybe it was the desperation, the terror I could barely keep contained. With a sigh, he tossed a key onto the counter. Room 12, he muttered. You pay first thing in the morning, or I'm calling the cops. Thank you, I breathed, snatching the key and stumbling out the door before he could change his mind. The room was as dingy as I expected peeling wallpaper, a bed that looked like it hadn't been cleaned in weeks, and a flickering light that cast unsettling shadows across the walls. But it was a locked door, and a moment to catch my breath, and that was all I needed right then. I shoved the dresser in front of the door, wedging it tight, and collapsed onto the bed, my body aching from the fall and the run. I lay there in the dark, every noise outside making me jump, every creak of the old building setting my nerves on edge. I knew they, it, was still out there, looking for me, and I knew it was only a matter of time before they found me again. My phone buzzed in my pocket, making me jolt upright. With shaking hands, I pulled it out, half expecting another cryptic message, but when I looked at the screen, I saw something much worse. It was a photo. A photo of me. But it wasn't from earlier that night. It was from right now, taken from outside my motel window. I stared at the picture in horror, my mind reeling. They were here. They'd found me. I dropped the phone, my heart hammering, in my chest, and turned to the window. And there, just outside, was my own face staring back at me. The glass cracked under the pressure of his, my fist as he slammed it against the window. The sound echoed in the small room, a terrible promise of what was to come. 
The bat was still in my hand, but I knew it wouldn't save me this time. This time, there was nowhere left to run. The glass splintered under the force of his, my, fist, spiderweb cracks spreading across the window like a disease. I was paralyzed, trapped in that moment where time seems to stretch out, where every sound, every heartbeat feels magnified. The cold air from outside seeped in through the cracks, carrying with it the unmistakable scent of decay, of something unnatural. His face, my face, pressed against the glass, distorting as he leaned in, those empty eyes locking onto mine. He smiled, that same twisted, uncanny smile, as if he knew he had me right where he wanted. And maybe he did. There was no more running, no more hiding. This was it. I forced myself to move, scrambling off the bed, my mind racing for a way out, a plan, anything. But all I could think of was how this was all my fault. If I hadn't been so desperate, if I hadn't sent in that DNA sample, none of this would be happening. I'd opened a door I didn't even know existed, and now it was too late to close it. The window shattered, glass exploding into the room like a thousand tiny knives. I raised the bat instinctively, but I knew it was useless. He was already halfway through the window, pulling himself inside with a slow, deliberate motion, like he had all the time in the world. Behind him, I could see more of them, more of me, their silhouettes lurking in the darkness, waiting their turn. I backed into the corner, the bat heavy and useless in my hands. My heart was hammering so hard, I thought it might burst. There was no escape. This was it. But just as he stepped fully into the room, something strange happened. He stopped. For a moment, he just stood there, his head cocked to the side, as if listening to something I couldn't hear. Then slowly, he turned his head to look at the others outside, and they too seemed to hesitate. It was like they were communicating without words, some silent exchange passing between them. And then he looked back at me. His eyes weren't empty anymore. They were filled with something dark, something that made my blood run cold. And when he spoke, it wasn't in my voice anymore. It was something else, something deeper, like a chorus of voices layered on top of each other each one slightly out of sync. We weren't supposed to exist, he or they said, the words echoing in the small room, making the walls feel like they were closing in. But you made us. You gave us life. And now, we need yours. I felt a cold dread settle in my bones, the realization sinking in. They weren't just clones. They were something more, something wrong, they weren't just copies of me. They were trying to become me, to replace me. And the worst part, they were getting closer with every passing second. My mind flashed back to the message I had received, the one that said, are you ready to meet your maker? It wasn't a threat, it was a warning. Whoever or whatever was behind this had created these things, and they were never meant to be out in the world. But now, they were and they were evolving, growing stronger, more sentient, with each moment, and they needed me to complete their transformation. I didn't have time to think, to plan. All I knew was that I had to stop them, whatever it took. I tightened my grip on the bat, trying to push down the terror threatening to overwhelm me, and I did the only thing I could think of. I attacked. I swung the bat with everything I had, connecting with his head with a sickening crunch. He, or it, staggered back, a black, tar-like substance oozing from the wound instead of blood. But he didn't fall. He didn't even flinch. He just turned those dark, hollow eyes back on me, that eerie smile still plastered on his face. The others were moving now, crawling through the broken window like a nightmare come to life. I could see their faces, 
each one a twisted, almost perfect copy of mine, each one more monstrous than the last. And I knew that if they reached me, if they succeeded, I would be gone. Not just dead, but erased, replaced by something that should never have existed. I kept swinging, kept fighting, but it was like trying to hold back the tide. For every one I knocked down, another took its place, their movements becoming more coordinated, more human. They were learning, adapting, and I was running out of time. The room was filling with that sickly sweet smell of decay, the air thick with it. My vision was blurring, my strength fading, and I knew I couldn't keep this up much longer. But then, just as I felt myself slipping, something caught my eye. In the corner of the room, half buried under a pile of old blankets, was a small metal box. I don't know how I saw it, don't know why I even noticed it in the chaos, but something in my gut told me it was important. Desperate, I lunged for it, knocking it over with the bat. The box tumbled open and out rolled a small glass vial filled with a strange glowing liquid. I didn't know what it was, didn't care. All I knew was that it was my only hope. I grabbed the vial and smashed it against the floor. The liquid inside burst out, sizzling as it hit the air, and immediately the clones reacted. They recoiled, hissing and writhing as the substance spread across the floor like a creeping mist. They tried to pull back to escape, but it was too late. The liquid was already eating away at them, dissolving their flesh, their faces, everything that made them me. They shrieked, a sound that cut through the air like a knife, and one by one, they began to collapse, melting into the same dark, sticky residue as the one I'd killed earlier. The last thing I saw before the world went black was my own face, twisted in agony, dissolving into nothingness. I don't know how long I was out. When I came to, the room was quiet. The only sound, the distant hum of the neon sign outside. The air was clear again, the smell of decay gone, replaced by the sharp scent of something chemical, something sterile. I pushed myself up, every muscle screaming in protest, and looked around. The room was empty, no sign of the clones, no sign of the nightmare I'd just lived through. The only evidence that anything had happened at all was the black residue on the floor and the broken glass from the vial. I should have felt relief, but all I felt was a hollow emptiness, a sense of loss that I couldn't quite explain. I'd survived, but at what cost? How many more were out there, waiting, lurking in the shadows, ready to take my place? I stumbled to the door moving like a man twice my age, and stepped outside. The night air was cool on my face, the sky starting to lighten with the first hints of dawn. Everything looked the same, but I knew it wasn't. I wasn't. As I walked away from the motel, leaving behind the remnants of my own twisted reflection, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over, that somewhere in some dark corner of the world, they were still out there, still looking for me, and that one day, they'd find me again.